So uh, thank you very much for cooperation for the smooth proceeding of the AGM. Then uh, first of all, thank you very much for coming uh, in the early in the morning, maybe. And then uh, I, I think you've already enjoyed a lot of Oakland and Apricot uh, sessions. And we come to the, on Friday, and uh, it's time for us to do the APNIC business. I'd like to quickly go through the agenda. Can I? Coming? I think, I think there's a slide for that. All right. Uh, yes, uh, we have the three sessions uh, planned. Uh, morning first, AGM one session. I'm doing the introduction. Uh, and then we, uh, we have uh, the election uh, this time uh, because it is AGM. Uh, so uh, the election, uh, election uh, procedures are uh, reviewed by the poll, Wilson. And then uh, the we, uh, we have Keith Davidson as the election chair this time. We appreciate much uh, his service uh, as the election chair. And then there's an uh, EPNIC secretariat report uh, afterwards, and then open mic. Slide. Next slide, please. Oh. Uh, AGM2, uh, morning second session. Uh, we will have the reports uh, from now, uh, fr from, from the second session. Uh, treasurer report. Uh, James Pensley is not here in person, but uh, he will make uh, the, the, his, uh, his report uh, delivered to you uh, remotely. And then uh, my EC report, open microphone. Uh, Paul Wilson will uh, pro uh, provide you the information on the survey uh, 2016. Epic Foundation, which will be described later. And the SIG reports uh, from the policy SIG, NRS SIG. That's, uh, that's pretty much for the second session. Next, please. Uh, afternoon first, AGM3 session. Uh, in the very beginning of the uh, afternoon first session, uh, the only afternoon session planned, uh, the is, uh, election voting uh, will be closed. And then we have the Corporation Civic Report, uh, both reports uh, for the IPv6 readiness measurement both, and then the I APIX report. And uh, we, are, uh, we are coming to the end part of the AGM uh, by having uh, the update on the next uh, APN conference. East election reports uh, come uh, at this point, and then vote of thanks and uh, AC uh, closing remarks. Then uh, we actually have uh, quite plenty of time uh, to do the uh, to do this job, then uh, I can I can suggest all all uh, all present uh, to uh, do that. Not really in rush, but uh, you have the plenty of time, like uh, ten minutes per single uh, report. So uh, please uh, elaborate your <laughs> report to the to the uh, this uh, AGM. Maybe this, this is pretty much of it. Then I'll pass my microphone to the Paul for the election procedures. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for, thanks for being here. I hope we've got an interesting day ahead. Uh, I hope Akinori doesn't regret uh, asking me to take my time, because that can take time. I'll do my best, Mr Chairman. Uh, the most important business of today is perhaps the uh, EC election, and uh, this is a uh, this is serious business. We've got um, a uh, an important process here. We've got a quite um, I hope stable, transparent, uh, clear election procedure, and I'd like to go through that just at, at the start of the day now, so that it's it's well understood by everyone in the room and the the timing and the. Uh, expectations are all clear, so uh, hopefully without being um, too uh, tedious and bureaucratic, I just think uh, I'd like to go through the, the um, procedures with you. So uh, in, at this election, out of the seven EC members, we've got 
three vacant seats. Uh, they're being elected today for a two-year term that, uh, that starts with the end of this, this meeting. There's been a call for nominations process that's carried out according to the bylaws and the timing that's prescribed there. Uh, so it uh, was opened in January and closed uh, in February on those dates. And of course, we've got uh, online voting as well as on site, and uh, that's been underway. Uh, all of the details are avail available on the uh, website URL that you see there if you want to see more than what I'm going to, uh, going to go through right now this morning. The uh, entitlement to vote is only via the members formally registered corporate contact people, so the authorised people with voting rights are able to vote. And uh, we have a voting allocation that is determined by the tier of membership of your, of your membership organisation, uh, which is determined in turn by, the, uh, by your IP address holdings. Uh, you can see the number of votes that are allocated per member are there in this table according to the membership tier of the, of the member themselves. The uh, online voting, as I mentioned, has been underway. It started earlier in February and it ended on, on Wednesday this week. The on-site voting is going to open today, very shortly, uh, with the announcement by the election chair and it ends, uh, very importantly, at 2 p.m. local time today. Uh, so you, you must uh, get your ballot papers into the ballot uh, box uh, before that time in order for them to count and there'll be reminders um, in order to help you to do that. The uh, ballot papers uh, can be collected but only by those with um, voting rights or appointed proxies and the the ballot papers are collected from the voting desk outside and if you haven't got those already then of course you can do that and the ballot box will be out there too, you'll see that as well. The um, voting ballot papers have got, they, they have a value in terms of the number of votes they carry, the maximum is 16 so if you are an extra large, a very large or extra large member, then you will receive two or four of those ballot papers to represent your 32 or 64 votes, respectively. Uh, you can uh, split your vote on different ballot papers if you, if you like, and you can trade in a larger value ballot paper for a number of small ones if you want to, um, for any reason, vote differently on the different, with the different uh, voting entitlements, entitlements that you have. Now, there are instructions that are clearly indicated on the ballot paper as to how to do that job uh, and not spoil your ballot paper and make it invalid. So please do look at the, um, at the ballot papers and uh, check that you understand those. And also uh, look for the validation stamp, which is a coloured stamp, which is put onto each of those papers uh, manually in order to validate them. This is what the ballot paper looks like. Uh, you'll notice the difference here between one and the other is that one of those is worth one vote and one of them is worth uh, four votes. And so you'll see the, the number, uh, the value of each ballot paper that you have. So as I say, please read the instructions on the paper and uh, your votes will, be, will then be counted. So the results of the election will be announced at 3 p.m. today, uh, local time by our election chair, Keith Davidson. And Keith, as election chair, will also be disclosing at that time any um, disputes that he's received and, and how those have been resolved and any communications uh, that have been made to the election scrutineers about any anomalies or issues. The uh, EC at the election at the EC meeting carried out in, uh, in Jakarta last year uh, made a decision about the exact data that would be disclosed about the election. We actually followed this disclosure um, policy at the number council election that was carried out in Jakarta, but just to remind you, the information that will be disclosed today about the, uh, in the declaration of the results will include the total numbers number of paper ballots received, that's individual pieces of paper, uh, as you've seen there, the total number that were invalid, 
and therefore the total that could be counted. Keith will be disclosing the total number of on-site votes that are represented there, the total of online votes that have been cast as well, the, uh, the total of those being the total number of votes that have been counted, and then there will be the total vote count received by each of the nominees. And uh, they, that, I think, will be in order of, um, of uh, highest to lowest. And they, they are the details as, uh, as decided and as we, according to the policy that we also followed last, at the last uh, number council election. That's, that's how the, the results will be declared today. So the details of the, um, the election, the appointees for this election, Keith Davidson as the chair, as uh, Akinori mentioned, George Quo and Connie Chan as the election officers appointed by the EC under our procedures, uh, Anna, George and Tom as election tellers, also appointed by the EC, and our scrutineers will be Michael Abahuela from, from Aaron and Ingrid White from RIPE NCC. Now, if there's any um, complaint or dispute regarding the election, then that needs to be lodged in writing with the election chair uh, no later than one hour before the scheduled declaration of the election, which happens to correspond with the, uh, I believe, with the closing time of voting at 2 p.m. Uh, those notices can be lodged by uh, nominees in the selection or by members through the authorised voting contact, and it will be up to the election chair to resolve though any, any such dispute and to let us know, uh, as I said before, uh, as part of the um, declaration later today. So are there any questions about that process? I hope it's, I hope it's clear enough. Um, if there are any further questions that you'd like to direct, you can do that to our election tellers or to Keith Davidson, who's sitting at the back here and will join us shortly, I think. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Then, uh, I think that's the clear enough for the election, and I, I directly invite uh, Mr. Keith Davidson uh, for, the, for the podium to, uh, uh, to deliver the, uh, his chairman's <coughs> explanation about uh, election uh, with a big appreciation for, you, for his service. Thank you, Keith. Or is mine. Thank you. Um, good morning. Um, I understand there is. Uh, oh, there are slides. Yes. Thank you. Um, my name is Keith Davidson. I think I know most of you, uh, and most of you know me. But just for the interests of transparency and openness, I'll make the declaration that I'm contracted by Internet NZ, who are a member of APNIC. Uh, my contract with them is a very uh, casual contract for a day a week and it revolves around uh, um, um, uh, uh, the, the roles that I have within ICANN uh, and has nothing to do with the relationship or, or membership of uh, APNIC. I'm not sure who from in Internet NZ is uh, voting and I'm, not, and, and I'm definitely not sure who they're voting for so I have no interest in the elections whatsoever on a personal basis. Um, I'm honoured, though, to be appointed uh, by the Executive Council of APNIC as the election chair, and I'm firstly going to invite the nominees up on the stage uh, one at a time to talk for up to five minutes each, but uh, can we confine it to no more than five minutes? Um, this is an opportunity for the nominees to share their vision with you and introduce themselves to you. After that, uh, we will open the ballot box and show you there are no hidden rabbits or anything inside, and then uh, George and I um, will take the box outside to the voting desk and that's when voting will start. Um, in the order that the nominations were received, the first nominee is Sela May. Sela May is not able to be, uh, attend this meeting, but you can see his profile on the election website. Um, and I'd like to invite uh, anyone from the floor to speak on Sela's behalf, if there is anyone. If not, 
The next nominee is Mohammed Harun Or Rashid. Uh, he is also unable to attend this meeting. His profile is also on the election website. Is there anyone who would like to speak on behalf of Mohammed? Nope, if not. The next nominee is Tomohiro Fujizaki, and my apologies if my pronunciation isn't uh, quite accurate. Uh, Tomohiro, um, would you like to make a statement? Yep. Thank you, election chair. Good morning, everybody. My name is Tomohiro Fujisaki, working for NTT Japan, and also a board member of Japan Network Information Center, JPNIC. It's my great pleasure to be here to present in front of you all. Okay. So my first APNIC was APNIC 2011th at the Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia in 2001. Since then, I've been joining all APNIC meetings and apricot meetings and actively participate in their APNIC activities. I served as an IPv6 technical co-chair and a program committee member of APOps. And now I'm serving as a number resource organization number council member. And I also joining the APNIC policy SIG actively. Okay, during these 15 years, the environment in the internet has been changed a big, big change. And also, APNIC's role has been become more important. And at the, uh, my first APNIC meeting, as I said, it is 2001. At that time, the IPv6 policy, new IPv6 address allocation and assignment policy was discussed, and I'm joining the APNIC policy SIG as a co-author of that policy. And the objection, objective of that policy was to improve the uh, IPv6 deployment in the world, but as many of you know, IPv6 deployment is even now ongoing <coughs> and need to tackle. And as also as many of you know, as many of you know, APNIC has been tackled the, that issues. And this is just one example. But, and in the internet currently, there are many many things to tackle to resolve, such as the cyber security issues, inf infrastructure building issues and internet governance issues, and so on. And I would like to serve to any community to resolve these issues, possibly as an EC member. My experience in the uh, technical area and the uh, community leader, leader area, such as the uh, internet society chapters, will help with that. I need your help. And thank you for your attention, and thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Tomohiro. Uh, next is uh, Rapinda Singh Peha. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the stage. Not here. OK. Well, um, is there anyone in the room who would like to speak on behalf of Rapinda? No. Nope. Then we can move on. The next nominee is Rajesh Sharia. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, Ma Yang. Um, is unable to come to Auckland, um, uh, and so the same uh, issue, is there someone who would like to speak on his behalf? Uh, there's someone here. Uh, no. Please come up. Hi, uh, this is Masaro, but it's, it's not. 
act as a policy chair. Let me lead <coughs> Mayan's statement. Uh, dear friends, my name is Mayan. Working in Beijing University of Paths and Telecommunication as a professor. Currently, I am a member of Technic Board of China Education and Research Network, CERNET, which linking over 2,000 universities and research organizations in China. I am in charge of the operation of the backbone node of CERNET in BUPT, which connecting over 50 universities in Beijing. I am familiar with IP address allocation, network management, and security issues and other internet operation related matters. For international organization working experience, I am now the IPv6, work, the IPv6 working group co-chair of Asia and Pacific Advanced Network, APAN. Uh, currently, I am happy to work with our community as an ISHI member of APNIC during last few years and promote internet development in our region. I am familiar with APNIC business and operations, open policy development process, and other APNIC activities. I would like to devote my knowledge, efforts, and time to the successful operation of APNIC in the best interest of APNIC members and stakeholders. I am sorry that I could not attend this APNIC conference in person, Thank you for your trust and support, both for me to work another time as an APNIC AC member. Thank you. And now the, the uh, next nominee is Rajesh Sharia. Uh, Rajesh, would you like to take the stage? Good morning, everyone. I can see very familiar faces since I first started attending APNIC back in 2006. But my interaction with the APNIC started in 2000 when I started my ISP. And I was being told that you have to get your IP resources from the APNIC. <coughs> thank you, Keith, for inviting me. And thank you, EC Chair and the ECs for considering me. It's my pleasure and honor to be here today to request your consideration for my candidature for the post of the EC. For those who are new to this August House, I must introduce myself, Rajesh Charya from India. By profession, I am an IT, IT entrepreneur and running a successful ISP in the name of CJ Online in the NCR Delhi town from past two decades. Incidentally, I'm a co-founder and elected president of ISP Association of India, which we call SPY, since 2006, and representing all the ISPs of our country, whether small or large. Frankly, and I have no shy to say that I did not have any technical background, but achieved all these to the support and confidence that my team envisaged in me, and the same holds true as a director of NICSI, National Internet Exchange of India, and the president ISPI. People who taught me the nitty gritties of the internet vary from the junior network engineer to the senior network engineer. And but I never felt shy and have treated all them as my teacher. And it is still a learning process and hopefully now I will learn from all of you as well. Being a family man, I believe togetherness at the ISPI. We members work together to address challenges of any member company and similarly in Nixie too. As a founding director of the Nixie, we have kept expanding from exchange point to CCTLD and finally in 2012, it was the greatness of APNIC for granting us the NIR, which is in the name of IRIN. And today we are able to be gathered 1,400 plus members into our NIR. I'm attending all the events like ICANN, IGF, Apricot, APNIC, SANOG, and as well as not attending, but also hosting the same through our team into the country for betterment and upliftment of the technical guy 
of the country. Now that the ethnic front, I am responsible for the first proposal which I made in 2007, I think, proposal 53 for minimum allocation to slash 22. By this way, we can see that we have at least uh, extended the time of the exhaustion of the IPv4 from by some period or by some years. Reason earlier it was the allocation was slash 21. Back home, I am also involved in various committee installed, constituted by the government of India, whether it's a broadband, whether it's a national security advisor for the cyber expert, whether it's a FIKI, PII, broadband penetration. I believe EPNIC now should work for the creating an atmosphere for connecting all the unconnected in our region, and for that, best practices and training to connect shall be shared by our technical experts where all it is being required. The best practice may include a nuanced approach of technology empowerment at the startup levels. If given an opportunity, I pledge to work by bringing our entire inter internet community of the region together, effectively representing the articulating their perspective with the bottom-up approach and inclusiveness, transparency, and will strive to resolve their issue of course, with the help of EPNIC Secretariat support. My main objective is when I'm saying that un connect the unconnected, it means that we should be uplifting all that underdeveloped economy of our region. And should, if elected, I can say that I will be representing now the Asian Pacific, not the India now. Thank you very much. Uh, lastly, we have uh, Kem Se Young. Uh, Kem Se Young, would you like to take the stage? Yeah, hello everyone. Morning. So, um, my name is Kem uh, Se Young. So today I'm going to um, just, let li the first thing I'm going to is introduce a little bit background of myself. So I'm currently a senior network architect of Akamai, which is um, one of the largest CDN. And in the company I'm doing um, of the peering interconnection and capacity planning for the whole Asia region. And I actually started the career in this um, internet industry since 2001 where I work in uh, Asia Global Coursing as an IP engineer, and I've been um, working um, the whole network setup for the whole Asia. And um, so with this um, experience, that actually enabled me to have an understanding of the different internet infrastructure, um, different internet setup in different countries. And so, uh, so I've been working with a lot of um, Asia telcos, because I think a lot of People here may have already been knowing me already. So for um, my involvement in the um, community, I've been actually attending APICOD, APNIC, um, and a lot of um, the local network operator groups um, in a lot of Asia countries since many years ago. So this include like um, Singapore, Philippines, Malaysia, or Philippines that have been um, actively supporting the organization by um, liaising with the local communities about um, the internet, I'm trying to bring the uh, internet knowledge sharing collaboration with the local community there. I'm also one of the uh, infrastructure team member for the APICOT APAN 2011, so uh, where I set up the conference and um, working with a lot of um, the different local the companies there. Um, so I'm also one of the founding member of the founding program committee of um, Hong Kong NOC, where we have worked together with Chihu about um, setting up a um, local in order to promote the Hong Kong internet community where we can collaborate, we can share knowledge, exp um, exchange experience about how to make a um, better internet, trying to bring the um, global knowledge exposure to the um, Local community. So my uh, motivation to um, being a elected be a 
uh, APTEC EC is that I want to be with my strong technical background and, and the internet is keep evolving, exchange, um, keep changing. I hope that I could bring my knowledge, uh, my experience, and of course with the regional ex um, experience that I have and to make a better policy um, for the community and to serve the um, whole Asia region better. Um, my personal goal is actually trying to make a better internet for everyone. So uh, I hope you guys support me. And uh, if you have any questions, um, feel free to let me know. Thank you. Thank you. And um, thank you to all the nominees for their speeches. Um, we'll now move on to the next stage, and that is the opening of the ballot box. Um, uh, George. <laughs> Um, and uh, this is to uh, show everybody that it's empty. Um, no, there's no false bottom. It's absolutely empty and um, there's nothing inside so we'll seal it now and in a moment uh, George and I will take it to the voting desk which is just outside the door over here uh, in the conference hall um, I'll declare that the election is now open and the ballot box will be kept outside and supervised by the election tellers uh, until voting closes so I'd like to remind everyone that voting closes uh, at 2 p.m., 1400 hours, uh, or UTC plus 13 for anyone who has that clock uh, today. So thank you very much, and uh, I'll uh, make sure that ballot box is the one that goes on the table. Thank you. Thank you very much, Keith. And uh, as he said, the ballot box is already Open? Yeah? Right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, uh, next, uh, next in, on the agenda is the EPNIC secret uh, no, activity report by our Director General, Paul Wilson. Thanks. Thanks, Akinori. So this is the um, report for 2015. It's, uh, I'm going to be pre presenting extracts from our activities of, of the last year. If you take a look, on the website, you'll find a written version of the report that shows that we uh, were probably uh, much busier or did, uh, had many more things on the list than I'm able to report today. But I'll, I'll take about half an hour to go through uh, what we think are the highlights of the last year. Uh, what drives APNIC these days, and this is something that has come out again in the uh, APNIC EC's uh, strategic planning, is a, a vision of a global, open, stable and secure internet that serves the entire Asia-Pacific community. You've probably heard that before, but it's something that drives us uh, every day of the week uh, at APNIC. We're reporting our activities, as you probably also know, under three major external areas, which are to serve our members, to support development of the internet in the Asia-Pacific, and to be cooperating with the wider a broader global internet uh, community to support the work that we do. Recently, we also uh, found, again, in, in response to the requests and the interests of the membership and community, we have moved to reporting our activities and our budgets according to those areas. So on this um, chart, just as an overview of what uh, happened last year, you can see how we budgeted and how we spent resources according to those three areas of serving members, supporting regional development and the global collaboration. The fourth one, of course, is corporate or business overheads, uh, which, is, um, which also forms ob obviously a proportion of budgets and activities. Now, we also break this, uh, this financial reporting down even further into specific areas within, within each of those four major divisions. And so again, we can uh, report uh, budget and actual expenditures 
according to those. Now you'll see, this is to give you an overview of the sort of the transparency and the structure that we're uh, inserting and developing at the Secretariat. You'll hear more about the details of the financial activities for last year in the, in the coming uh, EC Treasurer's report. So moving into the first of the major areas serving the members, I've got quite a few things to report, of course, because this, this accounts for a good 50% uh, of everything that APNIC does. The APNIC membership uh, burst through the 5,000 mark during the year. We're somewhere up at 5,200 plus at the moment. And as you see there, there's a really smooth uh, ongoing growth and acceleration in APNIC membership growth that has been happening pretty steadily over the last few years. Uh, contrary to what many people expected, we didn't start to flatten out yet in terms of new members, uh, which was somewhat expected due to the exhaustion of IPv4. On the contrary, actually, the last slash eight policy allows the small ISPs, network operators, enterprises to receive where they can justify it, a small allocation from the last slash eight blocks and uh, to receive that directly for their networks. And because they're not receiving the, those assignments from upstreams uh, so easily anymore, if at all, that, that's where our, um, our accelerating membership growth is coming from for at least as long, I suppose, as the, uh, as the remaining IPv4 pools last. Now, you could see the same effect, uh, even somewhat exaggerated in terms of the National Internet Registry uh, activities. So we've also broken 5,000 total members of NIRs, meaning that, uh, that APNIC uh, today is serving, directly or indirectly, probably 10,500 of the ISPs, network operators, network enterprises around, around the region. I think that's a pretty significant milestone to have achieved in the last year. You'll see in this, um, in this chart that there is some uh, pretty rapid growth going on in some of the NIRs. Uh, th this was all discussed during the NIR SIG this week, but I think it's notable to see uh, both C and NIC uh, accelerating uh, pretty rapidly in the, uh, the blue area at the bottom, and uh, IRIN, uh, operated by Nexius, the purple, that's also growing, uh, growing uh, very rapidly there. Okay, moving on to the actual resource activities. IPv6 uh, delegations has really taken a healthy uh, upward kick in the, um, in, the, in the last year to the largest number of allocations that we've ever made in a year, which is uh, just over 800. So I think that's a really good sign that we're seeing since the exhaustion during 2015 of, um, of the Aaron address pools. We've only got one RIR left uh, with any substantial amount of addresses for operational ISP allocations. Uh, that's Afrinic, of course, and uh, I think we're now seeing the effect of, um, of the almost complete global exhaustion um, kicking in during 2015. Now, these charts also show the types of delegations. Some of those are, are assignments, but most of them are allocations to ISPs. Uh, most of them are of the slash 32 default allocation size, and uh, the assignments, uh, they tend to be smaller blocks than those. IPv4 delegations are also accelerating pretty rapidly, as I said, with uh, the uh, availability of those small last slash eight blocks to enterprises who can't get addresses from the upstreams. We're also seeing a large number of those. So four and a half thousand uh, delegations of IPv4 that were conducted last year is, is by far a record number for, for APNIC. Uh, again, that's gonna go on for as long as those IPv4 pools uh, last, which is another few years, but not much uh, longer than that. Depends, of course, on the, uh, on the steepness of that uh, curve we're seeing there. Now, IPv4 transfers are accelerating or growing only slowly. We've only made just under 150 transfers in the last year. What you see in the blue is that most of these transfers are from APNIC to APNIC. Uh, there's a, a proportion, perhaps 20, 25%, that are inter-RAR transfers and they've been conducted with, with Aaron primarily, but also recently with the RIPE NCC that in instituted their uh, global inter-RAR transfer policy during the year. We've got a listing service, so when you have a pre-approval for an allocate for an IP for receiving an IPv4 transfer. I'm sorry, uh, you can be listed on the uh, on the listing service, 
and uh, that's where, where the two uh, pie, pie charts um, are illustrating the, the trends there as well. ASN assignments are interestingly accelerating. Traditionally, over the years, APNIC has not been very active in, in assigning AS numbers compared with uh, the other large, the largest RIRs. I think, again, we're having more uh, enterprises, more small networks, more peering, more diversity in the region, and, and therefore increasing our numbers of, of ASN assignments. And it's nice to see that the vast majority of those assignments are, uh, are four byte, 32 bit AS numbers as opposed to the two byte numbers. Uh, so we don't actually find that many of our members uh, are unable to use the four byte numbers, and that's a, that's a good sign too. Okay, now having looked at the overview of resource allocation activities for the last year, I'd, I'm going to go into the projects under our member service uh, area, which are notable. Now we've got a, 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 lo a long list of projects which uh, were planned at the beginning of the year and which have been undertaken, some new projects w which weren't planned. Uh, this report uh, will show you the status of those projects as, um, as they stand at this time using either a tick for complete or a spanner for in the works. And um, so we, we do have a long list. I'll, I'll show you the, the, the list uh, that, we, that we have. Um, but first I'll just highlight some of the, what we think are the most uh, important projects which were, which were completed, most of which were completed in the last year. Some of them are still underway. So we did. Uh, implement the RDAP protocol and deploy RDAP uh, during the last year with thanks to RIPE, of course, because it's their who is server software that we use. Um, if you don't know RDAP, it's the programmatic, standardized, API-based uh, or API-supporting uh, query, uh, JSON-based query response uh, system that replaces the traditional who is um, services. It's RESTful, it's, uh, it provides automatic redirection between different registries, uh, authorization and internationalization. So it really is the bee's knees um, for who is uh, access protocols and by far an improvement on, um, on who is itself. So that's been a, a significant deployment. I'm glad to say that the RIRs are all uh, well ahead of the, uh, of the game here. RDAP is, uh, is available to the names registries as well, but I think we have comprehensively deployed it across the RIRs by, by this time. Moving on, uh, RPKI, of course, is something that is, that is going to be an emphasis and an activity of ours for quite some years to come. We found that the deployment of RP, RPKI in the Asia-Pacific region was pretty low uh, up until last year. We instituted this Ready to Rower campaign, which is all about encouraging APNIC members and assisting APNIC members to, to uh, implement and to deploy their uh, route object authentications. So we've been presenting that at NOGS, we've been having hands-on sessions, we've, uh, we've got the tiger there and the t-shirts and, um, and all of that stuff. And we did uh, manage to increase the regional RPKI adoption last year from 0.8%, which is pretty low, to 2.7%, which is still low, but, uh, but a consider considerable increase. And in fact, that's reached about 3.1% already this, this year. So I think, um, I think the RPKI adoption and acceptance and experience is, is increasing quite nicely because of those, um, those activities. My APNIC is the portal by which APNIC uh, customers, members and non-members access uh, APNIC services for many um, functions. We've improved a number of those things after having conducted a My APNIC users survey during the year, which gave us a lot of good feedback about um, the direction and the priorities for, for My APNIC. One of those was, was the speed and responsiveness of the system, and that's been improved um, by, as we measure it, an average of 24% faster than it used to be. There's two-factor authentication using the standardized uh, time-based one-time passwords. There's uh, email-based login uh, authentication as well and there's better management of uh, who is objects, maintainers and so forth uh, through MyAPNIC. All of these things uh, reflect what was, uh, what was requested in the MyAPNIC uh, user survey. And the tick there, of course, means that these things are complete, although the work on MyAPNIC, of course, uh, will continue uh, quite rapidly through the year, as you may have heard 
through the coming year, as you may have heard in the, in the services session this week. The website has been uh, Im improved as well. We've got a new homepage which puts our APNIC blog up uh, front as a source of, of news and updates about APNIC, uh, and I'll, I'll mention the blog again later. The APNIC services uh, section of the website has been up upgraded substantially and is hopefully easier to navigate and to, to understand. That follows having done a similar job with the training website last year, or the year before, and will continue to try and overhaul the website as, uh, as time goes on to make it um, easier and clearer for everyone. Another survey activity during the last year was a training needs assessment because we do hear very regularly through training channels themselves and help desk and, and, uh, and our um, main survey that training is a, is a big priority in general for APNIC members. But we really do need to focus on what is the content and what are the delivery uh, methods that make sense and that suit everyone. So we, we found out about um, the needs for e-learning, online learning uh, of APNIC training materials. Uh, both sort of class-based live and self-paced. Uh, we learned about what are the expectations for face-to-face -face, um, classes, where, whereabouts and in what form, and, um, and also we actually uh, had, a, had, I think, a very clear indication there of the need for more and frequent training, particularly at the higher end uh, technical expert level, and so that's where we are um, moving with training during the year during the year and into the future. So last year, in fact, we had, a f we had relatively the same level of, of training activity as we did uh, during the previous year. Uh, that, that comprised uh, nearly 2,200 trainee individuals being trained face-to-face, -face, 77 courses in 20 locations, another 720 plus uh, trainees in 100 plus e-learning sessions. We've got a video archive with videos of training sessions and, and of in-house uh, training uh, presentations, uh, 80, 80 videos there and uh, well over 100,000 views. Now one of the things that, I mean this was a flat level of training activity uh, because of staff turnover and, and I think because of the need to, um, to really uh, focus on where we're going in future through the, the needs analysis and so on, um, but we are planning a steady increase in training. And one of the things that, is, that will help with that is that we're receiving more support these days for training to be conducted in different places for different, um, uh, for different uh, purposes and projects. And so, for instance, we received uh, financial contributions to training activities from World Bank, from J the Japan uh, International Corporation Agency, from the ITU. So this is all still training that is is strictly applying to APNIC uh, stakeholders. Uh, some of this is government policy work, but mostly it's actually about internet deployment, IPv6 and so forth. So it's still very much in our, um, in our core mission, but it's being supported by additional funding from, um, from elsewhere. And that's something that through member surveys in previous years, we've been encouraged to pursue because of course, training is generally conducted under APNIC's own financial resources and it represents a sort of cross subsidy uh, within APNIC's um, finances. And it's good to, uh, to receive support from elsewhere as well. Technical assistance is another area which we're asked to perform. There are many parts of the region which really need more help than training and workshops. They need some tailored uh, sort of advice in a, in a more interactive way. And we, we conducted a test, uh, a sort of trial last year with a couple of um, folks who traveled in Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Thailand talking to 30 plus members and really getting into details about what their network engineering challenges were. That was actually very successful. The, the problem with, with continuing that is sustainability and financing. So again, uh, it's something that we would be seeking some external assistance for. Now here's uh, more from the project list of things that I'm, I haven't gone to in, de in detail, but we have improved the system we call ARMS, which is the a APNIC registry management system, the internal, it's like the internal MyAPNIC that, um, that allows staff to manage member services. Uh, billing services improved with new merchant facilities, PayPal, uh, getting ready actually for recurring credit card billing in, uh, in the next year, which can be more often than the annual billing, that's something we're often asked for. Instant feedback, 
a sort of comprehensive approach to gathering information from members about their experience in meetings, training, website, MyEpinic, etc. Uh, we've uh, integrated uh, Skype into the help desk uh, so that uh, we've got uh, another mechanism for, uh, for easier uh, VOIP access to the, um, to the help desk. A new customer uh, relationship management system is coming, uh, coming into uh, existence. Uh, that's a work in progress, as the Spanish shows. We've completely upgraded the, the backup, um, the data backup systems at APNIC to something that, that will cover our current uh, and future needs for a while. We're looking at further upgrades to who is, that's to the master and the real, uh, the near real-time mirroring system proposed in 2016, improving our systems monitoring so that, uh, so that uptime is maintained. Uh, we're also looking at adopting uh, some aspects of the ISO 27001 uh, information security standards in, uh, in our approach to security and our overall framework. The training, training curriculum is still under development uh, along with accreditation and certification systems so that, uh, so that we have a, a more, uh, I suppose, a more formalised uh, systematic approach to training. Uh, and another thing we didn't plan at the beginning of the year was to look at um, the question of universal acceptance, that's IDN, International Domain Name, and International Email Address Usage and Acceptance in APNIC systems. So they're the major projects that, uh, that fell under our service to members. Now, I'll move on into the next couple of major areas, uh, supporting internet development in the, in the region. We put uh, our the policy activities into that because it's not strictly a secretariat, it's actually a community function. There were just two policies which were approved and implemented last year, which were modifications to the IPv4 and ASN eligibility criteria, so they were implemented uh, after having been uh, finally approved after discussion at the, at the APNIC uh, 40 uh, policy SIG. Of course, there were other policy activities going on during the year, but the, but the ones that the secretariat was actually asked to implement were those two. We have spent uh, an increasing amount of time reaching out to members and providing services through the network operator groups and there's really a, a, a fantastic increase in the number of NOGs which are being formed and becoming active around the region. So we had 17 NOG events in total during the year that we that we attended, both the sort of the, the longer term or traditional ones, SANOG and PACNOG, but also a number of, of new and up, up and coming NOGs. And you know, the network operator groups are the places where local tech uh, engineers and uh, staff of ISPs, all of whom are in our, our constituent uh, membership, they can come together at a local level. So it's really a fantastic place for us to be giving updates about APNIC activities, but also providing direct services like hostmaster consultations, training, and, uh, and so forth. So we're pretty, pretty active in that area these days and it's a really um, effective way, I, th I hope, to reach out and, um, and communicate with members. There are other community development activities as we, as we call them. Often these things are delivered through NOGS, so we're supporting the RIPE Atlas project pretty actively these days. There were five anchor deployments around the region, that's the servers that actually gather. Uh, and, and aggregate data and uh, something over 120 individual Atlas probes that, uh, that go around. There's some, uh, some happy, uh, happy probe uh, recipients illustrated. Oh, I'm going, going ahead here. There's some, uh, so there's some happy uh, probe recipients there uh, in the Philippines uh, showing off what they've, uh, the little uh, toy that they've just got. But each of those probes actually um, when it's wired, when it's connected, it automatically gathers data from the, from the network it's connected to and, uh, and that data contributes to a, a fantastic data set that uh, is hosted at, uh, at NCC. Uh, supporting LROOT server instances, uh, in particular they're the servers that ICANN has been deploying and we've been working with ICANN on, um, on those. Working also with the Network Startup Resource Centre on IXP support in two locations during the year and also fellowships. So there were 16 fellowships uh, for Apricot in, um, in the last year, 24 for APNIC 40, including uh, youth fellowships, which, uh, which encouraged younger um, applicants and students to come and participate in the processes. 
Okay, IPv6, it's still very much on the APNIC agenda. There were um, at least 13 training courses last year, over 500 trainees, plus a bunch of presentations at different IPv6 and related events, um, encouraging understanding and awareness of IPv6 and also various technical, technical aspects as well, IPv6 measurement uh, that uh, APNIC Labs is, uh, is conducting, for instance. We had um, a technical assistance on IPv6 in Mongolia associated with training there and also under some funding uh, support from the ITU. We're still supporting the Asia Pacific IPv6 task force at APNIC as well, just simply providing a base for the Secretariat. Security outreach, that's uh, an area of increasing importance and demand. Uh, the, the demand for security information and support is accelerating at a, at a faster rate these days than, than IPv6, and it's really something that um, we're finding ourselves um, being able to help with. Now, security is a huge area. When I talk about security activities at APNIC, I'm talking about security in relation to IP addresses. It's about routing security. It's about the WHOIS database. It's about the best practices that avoid, for instance, address spoofing and so on. Adli Wahid, uh, who actually was involved with um, establishing the, the MyCert uh, a few years ago, has been really busy attending NOGs and CERTs, law enforcement uh, events where there's a real demand for better understanding of these security issues that we deal with. Adley is a member of the first board. Uh, Jeff Houston has, uh, has joined the ICANN Stability and Security Advisory Committee. Adley is on the Interpol uh, Global Cybercrime Expert Group. So you can see it's pretty busy. I really think uh, and hope that we're going to be able to put more resources into this because, uh, because at the moment there really is a huge demand and I'm sure you're all experiencing that as well. APNIC Labs, uh, we have this uh, measurement uh, system that was, was invented, developed within APNIC. Uh, it's taking over three million measurements a day these days, direct measurements from code running in browsers all around the, all around the internet and measuring IPv6 capability, IPv6 preference, DNS and DNS and DNSSEC characteristics as well. That system was re-implemented in HTML5 during the year, so it runs now on mobile devices as well. Previously running Flash, it wasn't, um, it wasn't measuring too many mobiles at all. So that's why I think our, our, measure, our measurement rate has gone up from what was one, one million a day to three million a day these days. So that data actually contributed some important uh, information to ICANN for the DNS in relation to the DNS uh, root zone key rollover and uh, IDN acceptance and of course it's well known through Jeff's uh, incredibly entertaining, d dense and informative uh, presentations that, uh, that keep him busy uh, with many um, events around, around the world. We implemented experimentally something called VisAS, the ASN visualization um, exploration which allows you to take a particular economy, for instance, and look at the ASNs that have been assigned, allocated within that economy and how they are interconnected, how densely uh, within the economy. And it's, it's been a pretty interesting way to have a look at the density of interconnection in different economies of the, of the region. And it's really an informative thing, a very interesting talking point for network operator groups and, uh, and others. So you can find that on the, la on the lab's uh, website and uh, we expect it to be integrated into my APNIC for easier, easier access in due course. Other APNIC events, we've had what we call APNIC uh, regional meetings which are often associated with, with NOG meetings. It's just the banner that we hang over the, the, um, the NOG involvement where we have hostmaster consultations and other extra activities. But 16 economies had those meetings in 2015 uh, well over 600 members attended those events, but also at our, at our conferences last year we had 1,300 attendees. The Jakarta meeting uh, last year was our biggest ever standalone meeting with, with well over five, 500 people. It was, a, it was a great success, as you'd know if, if you were there. Communications at APNIC is, uh, is also something that we take uh, very seriously. As I mentioned, the blog is something that had its first full year of, of operation last year. It's now on our front page. It's, um, we've had 376 blog posts in the last year, and that includes 68 
event wrap reports, the reports from staff who have gone out and, um, and come back and are, are, are bringing informational lessons back uh, that we want to share with membership. Uh, 116,000 views and just recently we won an Asia Pacific Ele Excellence Award from a, an executive communications magazine uh, as the best blog in the Asia Pacific. So that was a really nice, uh, nice boost, uh, particularly for Tony, who's, um, whose brainchild the blog is, but also Tony's team and everyone, everyone who, who contributed to that. So I think it's a, it's a huge uh, success. Uh, ICEF Asia, that's the small uh, collaborative R&D research grant program, which has been going on for quite a few years now. But we have started in the last year an internet operational research part of that. So anyone who's got project proposals in network measurement, in IPv6 deployment, for instance, routing security, uh, there can be small grants made available to do that work and to make it, uh, make it better, uh, to share it with, with our community and, um, and to assist with uh, development of the internet in the region. So ISIF is a broader program that's uh, collaborative, as I've said, in the last year we had uh, under the funding that came from both Sweden and Canada, we had a set of awards, uh, 78 nominees for those awards from Asia Pacific and five of them very interesting projects awarded, uh, four grants for projects and then coming in 2016 we're, we're launching the, um, the next round of both the technical operational research and the, um, and the uh, more community impact sort of grants. So please take a look at the ICEF.Asia website for more about that. Another thing that was uh, developed in the last year, and thanks very much to all involved with this, uh, was the cooperation SIG. So we've had, we had two successful meetings uh, in 2015. We had another one just this last week. Uh, and that's the, area, that's the area of this meeting where if you want to discuss and hear about the sort of overlap between what APNIC does and the people around us who are kind of de depending on us, wanting to cooperate with us, or vice versa, then the cooperation SIG is the is the place to to hear about that stuff, and it's been it's been a great success. Thanks to thanks to all all involved. So just finally moving on to the global cooperation front, where we're really collaborating, cooperating with with many others around the world. As the map shows, we tend to focus on the region. I think we absolutely have to do that, but we're also involved with coordination with other RIRs with internet organisations, ISOC, ICANN, IETF and so on, the ISTAR group as it's called in some cases. We're involved with engaging in government agencies in some training and skills development. There, there have been cyber, cyber conferences in Europe and in, in the UK which we've attended. A big one in this last year is supporting the IANA transition. I'll have a couple of words to say about that. And I think the idea is generally to promote the RAR model which is part of what we call the multi-stakeholder model of, of internet development. And so that in itself is a global issue and, and it has required some, uh, some global engagement uh, throughout the last year as usual. Now the IANA stewardship transition, we were very active in the last year. This has been, a, for the entire internet community, an extremely costly and extensive involved uh, complex process uh, for APNIC. It's, been uh, less so, but still something that we have had to work on very actively. I'm not going to go into all the details of what happened last year. I think it's probably useful to really show what the results of last year's activity were uh, in terms of where we are today. So the stewardship transition was planned by a coordination group which produced a transition plan that is an operational uh, implementable plan for IANA stewardship transition. They produced that plan in October last year. That plan has not yet been submitted to the US government that needs to, needs to approve it because it's been waiting for another process. It's the process of ICANN's accountability uh, review and, and improvement. So, so the transition proposal really hasn't gone anywhere for some time because of this accountability process which itself has been another uh, complex and, um, and quite challenging thing. Just this week, the uh, so-called CCWG, the Cross Community Working Group on ICANN Accountability, produced its final report and it was approved by that uh, working group for 
the next step, and the next step is for chartering organisations, and that includes the uh, the ASO NRO, to approve that by the 9th of March. Now you'll you'll hear a little bit about that approval process. It's a sign-off that needs to be done after a very long uh, transparent process. You'll hear about that uh, via uh, the, the the mailing lists and uh, and groups and so forth shortly. The next steps on that is that the ASO uh, needs to submit an, an approval that we are actually uh, satisfied with that in order that that plan, the, the CCWG, the accountability plan and the transition plan can both go to the, to the ICANN board, then to the US government for approval. And if everything goes well, then the US government will approve it uh, before September the 30th. When we reach September the 30th, the IANA relationship the ICANN relationship with the US government will, will finish finally after, um, after about 18 years of discussion. ICANN was set up in the first place to allow this to happen. It was originally supposed to happen no later than about the year 2000. It's taken us a little, little bit longer than that and hopefully it will all be out of the way quite soon. The implementation of that plan involves, for us, just a few things. We have to finish development and signing an agreement with ICANN so that ICANN will be providing its IANA services to the RIRs. We've just yesterday published the fourth version of what we call the service level agreement with ICANN and we're going to be meeting with ICANN next week or the week after uh, for, the, for the final, hopefully, uh, discussion and, uh, and agreement on that. That's been a completely open process. If you're interested in what the details are, they're all available online. There's a question of IANA intellectual property rights, where the property rights that are held by ICANN uh, should be transferred actually into a, a more neutral place, into the, the global community somehow. It's been agreed that those things will go to the IE, IETF trust, and uh, the terms of that transfer and the holding of those um, intellectual property rights is, are being developed now. Finally, there is, as part of the transition plan developed by the CRISP team, as you might recall, there uh, is something called a review committee, which will comprise three members from each region. Now, just in this week, uh, the APNIC EC has, uh, has arrived at the appointment, the proposed appointment process and the appointments to that committee, and from the APNIC region, that is, and we will hear more about that shortly. RAR collaboration, uh, moving on. Uh, we've been collaborating very closely on one thing in the last year, which is the IANA transition, but that's not the only thing. We've um, established a committed stability fund to make sure that the RAR system is seen as being mutually or, or self-supporting in case of any uh, problems that might affect the sustainability of any RAR. We've published a transparency matrix which shows the world in comparison, how all of the RARs work in terms of transparency and governance. APNIC has had uh, collaboration on research, primarily APNIC labs with uh, NCC and LACNIC. Uh, with AFRINIC, we've supported their uh, AFRINIC 23 event uh, by sending and exchanging uh, expertise uh, with them on, on event organisation. Um, there's active NRO coordination in various areas and there have been uh, other staff visits uh, to APNIC during the year. So just finishing up, and I hope I've uh, taken Akinori quite seriously in the um, stretch it out um, suggestion, um, but you asked for it. Uh, coming next, APNIC 42 is uh, in Dhaka in Bangladesh uh, later this year, and you'll be hearing more about that. We really hope that um, being co-located with BDNOG in, in the South Asia region, which is incredibly uh, growing fast, very dynamically these days. That's going to be another, I hope, record-setting uh, meeting with a, with a great program. So I really hope that uh, everyone here can make it there and bring all your friends and colleagues. After that, uh, very briefly, you probably know Ho Chi Minh City uh, will be the next apricot in 2017, and then APNIC will hold uh, APNIC, uh, what is it, 44 in uh, Taichung, Taiwan, uh, in September next year. And that's all from me, so I'm happy to answer any questions uh, now or at any open mic time that might come up in the rest of the meeting, but I'll hand back to Aki Nori for uh, agenda management now. Thank you.
question to the, the Paul's, uh, Paul's report, but uh, I, I'd like to have it uh, as an open microphone time, and then I'm really pleased to have the Rajesh for the mic, please. <clears throat> Good morning, Rajesh Charya, President ISP Association of India. First of all, I must congratulate Paul and his team for creating such a fine blog that our IPNIC has got the Excellence Award from the Asian Pacific country. I will request everyone to please clap on the community behalf for the IPNIC staff and DG. <laughs> Secondly, the EC team, which is leading the IPNIC, Mr. Mayamura, under your leadership, we are getting a lot of training in terms of IPv6 and security. We hope that as your guidance, as your leadership towards the sending the expertise to the different, different country, my suggestion will be that we should now focus more towards the underdeveloped country and the underdeveloped economies so that they should be also coming uplifted and they should be coming at the par with the developed country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have a very great recognition of yours. I'm very happy to see the uh, quite a successful operation of the APNIC Secretariat. And then uh, I mean, that's really great news that, for example, the blog has, award, has been awarded and then uh, have a very really good look. Thank you very much, Rajesh, to point it out. So uh, this is still open microphone time. We, we've got plenty of time then. <laughs> Please never hesitate to say something. Any online comments? For sure. Was it clear, crystal clear what Paul delivered? Maybe that was perfect. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, uh, as Paul said, uh, not not uh, not only for the open microphone session. I uh, we are very happy to uh, answer your question in the break and in, in every uh, occasions. So please uh, come up uh, to us for the for the, your questions. 